The 2024 Olympics is among us, and this year marks the 100-year celebration of Team Ireland's participation at the Games. Here to speak with me today about his own Olympic journey and memories, 1992 boxing silver medalist, the boxing legend, Wayne Pocket Rocket McCullough. Okay, so I'm joined today by Wayne Pocket Rocket McCullough. Wayne, it's an absolute pleasure. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure. You're a good friend of mine and I really appreciate your time today. Happy 4th of July. First of all, how are you and your family? I'm doing good. Big holiday here in America. Probably the one of the biggest one of the year. So a lot of fireworks tonight. We're just enjoying it. Now you've already told me you gave your fighters the day off, but have you taken the day off from training? Probably not. No, I've already been out running. <laughs> every, 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 every day I wake up, I go running just sort of, I think it's good for the mind, you know what I mean? So I just go out for a run, clear the mind, get a get a workout in, and keep myself in shape. <laughs> okay, so let's today is specifically about the Olympics. It's just around the corner. There's a rich history in this country, and, and people get excited. There's a buzz about the Olympic Games. Um, let's start with you and uh, and your successes and your experience in the Olympic Games. Now, most people will associate your well, of course, your success with 1992 in Barcelona, but your Olympic journey started four years previous in Seoul. Tell us a little bit about, because you were only 18 years of age, the youngest team member. Tell us a little bit about being selected, uh, the preparation and just your memories of this time. Well, first and foremost, the Olympics, it's big in Ireland, but over here it's, it is massive. You know, I've been watching the Olympic trials all week, the athletics, the swimming and everything. And it's, everybody loves the Olympics over here. When you, when you talk about my belts, they want to see the medal. <laughs> I'm like, what? I'm a world champion. Let me see your medal. But my, ex my, my experience as a kid, as a 15 year old kid, you know, I told most of my friends I wanted to be a world champion, but I wanted to get, get maybe get a medal or some, some sort of big competition. And Olympics was the gold. And then at 17 years old, I beat the national champion. P.J. O'Halloran, and I stopped him in the third round. And then they put me in with a, a Scottish guy, knocked him out, a, a Cuban, and knocked him out. Then I fought the leader to Getty, and they, I knocked him out. And so I had a good round. I had 12 knockouts in a row as a as 100, what was it, light flyweight, 48 kilos. <laughs> and I, yeah, I was, I was stopping everybody, and, and I say 12 knockouts in a row at that level. And that was the Olympic year. And I was I just, I say, I, was, I wasn't 18 till July. And that was like February, March, April. And, and then that year it was, say, the Olympics. And they, they picked me to, to go to the Olympics. And that was, that was a dream. Not, to, not the medal, just to get to the Olympics. You know what I mean? Just to get there. You're an Olympian for life. And, and I say that Olympics was the, the big one where like, I carried the Irish flag into the opening ceremony. Actually, just on that, if I can just touch on that for a moment, because I was speaking to my cousin, Gavin Graney, huge fan of yours, always has been. So he said to say hello, first of all, but that was his question. That was his question. He wanted to ask um, about the reception. Now, I believe it was generally positive, but were you anyway nervous about being from Shankill, going to represent Ireland, carrying the flag? Was there any kind of uh, mixed um feedback from that or, or what was that experience like I, th I think i think people were trying to make something out of it because because of where i was from but everybody knows me it I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for sport i'm a i would say i'm a sportsman not a politician and i was the young, youngest member of the team and that i'm not sure if the youngest member of the team gets to carry the flag all the time so i'm not sure if they just put it on me you know it was um, pat mccrory was the one who asked me to leave pat mccrory and they said, think about it. And I, and I was thinking, what's there to think about, really? You know, I'm representing Ireland. I'm proud to represent Ireland. And one person every four years gets to carry the flag. Into the, into the stadium were 10,000 athletes from around the globe, the best athletes in the world. And yeah, I'm going to say, no, I don't, so, no thanks, no thanks. <laughs> well, I'm like, of course. And I think they were like took back. Maggie Hawkins was our coach too. And and I've seen different stories about, oh, I shouldn't have did it, but what? I shouldn't have did it? You know, if, I, if, I'd, have, if I'd have said no, I don't want to do it, you know, I'd have, I was probably took a lot, of, a lot of bad publicity for that, but I'm representing Ireland. I'm at the Olympics, and, and it was actually a positive thing for me 
for the Shanker Road where I was born and reared, it was a positive thing for them. It's because, you know, a little guy from the Shanker Road carrying the, the, the flag into the opening ceremony, forget about the, the politics. And when I came back home, I say the Shanker Road had a party for me. And they walked me down in front of, behind a flute band, the Shanker Road flute band. So if there was bad blood about it, they wouldn't have did that. You know what, I love that. I think I always said it to people, sport, I mean, politics should not come into sport. I, I just hate even mentioning that in the same sentence. Uh, you know, unfortunately, it is a big thing for some narrow-minded people. But I, I love that about you, and I've always said it to you as well, personally. You, you've broke boundaries, you've united a nation, you've always had the support of both sides, and I love that. No, you're right there, but there's always a, a small majority of people on both sides that'll say he shouldn't have did it, oh, he shouldn't have did it. Well, put them into the position where Dave did it. You're walking in the Olympic Games. First of all, you're, I'm at the Olympic Games. I barely, just barely turned 18. And that was just a goal was just a goal that I achieved right away. Then the kind of flag was just something through on me. I'm like, well, I'm, I was honored to do it, you know what I mean? It's an honor. And I say, but if some people have bitter blood, then they're going to keep it going forever. And that was, that was 36 years ago. <laughs> Exactly. And, and you know, when I always say it, and there's a lot of this rubbish in football as well, but I always say holding on to that kind of hatred, it really drains your energy. I mean, it, it, you have to be very careful what you put your energy into. Life's too short. And, and holding on to hatred like that, we won't get too political or anything, but holding on to hatred for the past of a completely different generation is not the way to a brighter tomorrow. So, No, Eugene, you're 100%, you're 100% right. And, and... The people that do hold on to that stuff, they say it's, it was, it brought positive stuff to the Shanga Road. And I say, I'll not talk about it, I got to carry the Olympic torch up the Shangle 2012, another positive thing. So that was, people think of the Shangle or the Falls Road as Catholic Protestant areas that are just bitter and they're fighting all the time. There's, there's good people there. There's good people on, on the, the Shanga Road and the Falls Road that, that um, want normality. Exactly, exactly. And I, you know what, that's another thing, talking about no matter where in the world you live, I've often said to people, you know, people would say, what, what's it like where you're from in Galway? I say, you know, it, I love it. And of course, I'm going to be biased, but I could, I could go there with a camera and shoot a little documentary showing two completely different sides. I could, I could make, I could make you feel like, oh, I have to go there on holiday. Or you could look at other parts and say, Oof, not for me. It's everywhere. That's you could do it. I get my American friends that go over to had two two over last year. Went to Belfast, went to Dublin. I set them up to train with Michael in Dublin. Sent them up my my friend Stephen Kirk in Belfast. They got to see the the real side of of Belfast and they loved it. They loved they loved both Dublin and Belfast, and they got to see. You go on a tour over there. You take what they want you to see. But when you go to my friends, took them to the you know there was no bitterness. It was just. That side, Michael took him to Dublin around there, so they get to see the real Ireland, you know what I mean, north and south. That cousin that I told you about, Gavin, he loves going up to Belfast, whether it's for concerts or, or boxing events. And uh, yeah, he loves touring around, loves it. For Taylor, Taylor Swift. <laughs> Taylor Swift, maybe. I'll ask him about that. <laughs> Um, okay, so getting back to the Olympics, the Soul 88, that is actually where you were given the nickname, wasn't it? The Pocket Rocket. How did that come about? Who was it that gave that to you again? It was one of, one of my, I was the youngest member of the, the boxing team. Most of them were, because Michael was like, I think Michael was 20, 21. And then the rest of them were like 23 to 25, more or less. Billy Welch was on the team, Kieran Joyce. Um, jo John Laurie was, well, we shared rooms with John Laurie. And um, Paul Fitzgerald. Don't want to leave anybody out. And um, I say, Kieran Joyce, I thought so, he said, he looked at me and I was, I was about this size. It wasn't fully grown, but I, and I was making, I was making 48 kilograms pretty easily. And they were all sweating to get their weight off. And um, he just said, you, you're small. And you throw so many punches, you're like a rocket. I'm going to call you the pocket rocket. And I said, I actually like that. You know what I mean? But the pocket, the pocket rocket, that was, that was 1998 or sorry, 88. And um, I've had that name ever since. And the Americans love it. The Americans love the pocket rocket. Um, between Soul 88 
and of course Barcelona 92. You had a wealth of experience and success as well. You had Commonwealth gold for Northern Ireland in 1990. You had a, th a bronze medal in the Boxing World Cup also um, in 1990. And then, so going into Barcelona 92, you know, you're, you're more developed as a fighter, as a man. Uh, you have more experience and success behind you. How different was that from Seoul 88, the young kid, to Barcelona 92? And, you know, was there more expectation on your shoulders? Did you feel that? Well, 88, I was still, I was a kid, you know, I wanted, I wanted to go pro after, after the mix in 88. But my old coach, the late um, Harry Robinson, you know, it convinced me to stay amateur because I was, I thought I was fully grown, you know, but I wasn't. I'm going to say I'm small, I'm a small guy anyway, but I was about this size and I did grow more and I went up to two weight divisions, but I was sort of like in the between of turning pro amateur. And then, you know, you have ups and downs between 88 and 92. You know, the last, I would say my good friend, actually, I, I talked to him once when I, Paul Buttimer was the last guy to beat me in the 89. Close fight, but it was a wake up call for me, you know what I mean? To say, you know, you haven't even finished it. You're only getting started. So I say Paul and me went to the Olympics in 92 together as well. He, he was, he was a weight class below me, but I say 1990, I moved up. I was a flyweight, won the gold medal to come off games. The first since Barry McGuigan in 78. And, and then I moved up the bantamweight that year because the world, the world cup boxing was on. It was, it was actually three weight, three weight classes were in Dublin. I think, I think there was actually four weight, sorry, there was 12 weight classes then, four, four, and four in three different countries at different times of the year. I went to Bombay, India, which is now Mumbai, but there was, there was four weight classes in Dublin and I was a flyweight. I, I went to the training camp. I couldn't make flyweight anymore, but they were trying to keep me boiled down. So I, I moved up and they sent me to, um, to Bombay and I had a good competition because the first, first competition of bantamweight was the World Cup and the World Cup there's only one bronze medal. So when you lose a semi-final, you have to fight the other losing semi-finals. Imagine doing that at the Olympics. Imagine doing that. You know what I mean? And Ireland's only ever World Cup medalist. It was a tough competition. And the, the fight for the bronze medal after losing was, was a bit crazy. But that's, they want to rank you one, two, and three. It is, but they want, it was a ranking competition. So after that, I was rated number, number three or four in the world. You know what I mean? In Barcelona 92, I remember having this conversation with you before and I was asked, talking to you about winning your silver medal and you quickly corrected me. Well, you, you interrupted me and you said, um, did I win a silver or did I lose a gold? And you just made me think of it in a completely different way. Now, it sounds harsh, but I understand where you're coming from. At the, at the, at so, no, it, it does sound harsh, but at the same time, it's, you know, as an athlete, you're always trying to be better. And for me, for everybody, they always say, everybody, you won an Olympic medal, you won the Olympic silver. And I don't, I don't crack, I don't say to them, and I mean, I've said to some people, but I lost, <laughs> you know, and that, that's my mindset because they want to be better. But that's a winner's mindset, Wayne. That, that's, that's a good way to be. Yeah, well, it probably is because, like I said at the start of this, my step, I wanted to be a world champion, 15 years old. I said to people, I said to my friends, not disrespect any belts, but I wanted to be WBC champion and I did it, but I wanted to get that medal of some sort along the way, which I, I ended up getting three major medals from 88 to 92, which was, was partly to do with Nicholas Cruz Hernandez, the, the Cuban coach. He was, I remember him when he came to my school, I remember him coming to my secondary school. He came in uh, looking for people to recruiting uh, people that wanted to train in the Olympic boxing gym, which opened in Galway, uh, in Westside in Galway. And uh, that cousin, Gavin, that I keep telling you about, he was training there as well. But Francie Barrett, this, this gym was opened. Yeah, it was kind of opened in, in, kind of in honor of him, really, as far as I remember. Um, so um, Cruz came into our gym looking for fighters. And I just remember, look, he was a big man. He's a big man. Big man. And Francie Barrett, I, I met him at the Olympics. He was the first, I think he was the first gypsy to go to the Olympics or something, I think, wasn't he? So that was, but Nicholas, Nicholas is a big man. I still talk to him. And from 88, he trained us for the Olympics in 88. Didn't go to the Olympics. But he, for 1990, for the Commonwealth Games, he, he trained me too. My, my coach, Harry Robinson, was always there. And I mean, the four or five weeks before competition, 
Nicholas took over. And I would say it was a different level. It was just a step up, pro amateur style. And then 92, he trained, of course, the World Cup as well, trained as there. So, and then four years from 88 to 92, I got four major medals. So that was, that's, that's a big achievement if you consider all Irish fighters of, of the, the past, you know what I mean? Getting four or getting three major medals in four years. And it goes to show how much I, I improved along the way. And I was still, get the, when I got the Olympic medal in 92, I just turned 22. So it was just, I was still young. And as I say, I, I wanted to get that major medal. I ended up getting, God was good to me. I got, I got, I got three, <laughs> you know. Can we get a look at it? Have you got it with you, the medal? It's in your pocket. <laughs> oh, show us all of them. What do you have? No, no, my, my, my World Cup medal is back. My, my dad has that back home. But I've got, I've got the Commonwealth gold, which is my, do- my daughter, this, she, she calls them vintage. You see this one? Oh, this one's so old and tarnished. You see? But that was, a, back then, it was a, where is the camera? That was the first in, since 78, you know what I mean? On the back, it has the, what do we call it? Then? Yeah, it's, it's thick, but the, the Olympic medals, the way they set the Olympic medal was, was cool because they set it like on a platform. You see this? You know, it's just set like on a, so it sits out, see like that? And then, and then they, they actually, Engraved, engraved at the back, and they did this in the village for us and put the weight class on it and stuff. Fifty-four kilos, weight color. And the good thing is, the good thing is too, the gold, silver, bronze. They gave me a, a, a gold pair of aviator Ray Bands. I still got them. What what feelings do you have holding them, looking at them right now, thirty-two years later? No, the, the, this medal here, especially this year, of course, with the Olympics coming up, and I trained some guys. They work for NBC here in the studios and one for one from CBS studios. So they when they see the medal like oh. I said, Hey, do you want to put it on? And they're like, put it put it on? I'm like, Yeah, I put it I put it I put it around their neck and they're like like just so took back from it that I put it around their neck, my medal, and they're like, I said, put it around your neck, it's fine. And they're like, Really? So people come in, they they want to see that, they're in a big medal. You know what I mean? They just they just they say there's not too many get Olympic medals and I think I did, I did some there recently for some build up the Olympics. And I think they said there was 26 living medalists in Ireland. 26. But you know what? Yeah, you see, USA is so big and so many medal holders. Ireland have only had 38 uh, medal winners. So 26 is not too bad. And the majority, I say the majority was boxing. Oh, I have a little quiz for you at the end. And that's one of the questions. So we'll see. <laughs> Show me the WBC belt before uh, we move on. Well, this is the the original belt right here, which is Nate. That's well, I'm wearing this shirt. A, a guy back home made this the shirt for me. Wayne McCulloch. It's, it says it's got the Akashizi on the. Let me stand it. Yeah, don't know you can see it. Can you see it? Oh, nice. Very nice. Probably has the date as well, does it? Yeah, and on, on the on. Well, I wasn't. I was next year. Be thirty years. So that was this shirt. Will be good next year. And um, this, I say, this belt was my dream. You know what I mean? And the, and I'm still. Kitty Taylor has has two of these now, but I'm the first. And still the only, still the only male. And this belt. Think about it. This was thirty years ago, and still the only male to do it. And before that, the WBC belts been out since the seventies. So it just goes to show you the the prestige of that. Where I say I'm a w, WBC ambassador as well. Well, it's, it's, this is the old, the old pictures that was um, on that side. You got Joe Lewis, and this side you have Muhammad Ali. That's Joe Lewis, and you have Muhammad Ali. But the new, the new belt, which I got, a, I got a Mauricio Sullivan, because I work for the WBC. I do like like stuff for them, and I, and the WBC belt now. Then this is like a replica belt, and this has got. Muhammad Ali, the late, you know, Jose Suleiman, who's a president. He was a president of the, the same thing. Same thing on the other side. But it's, it's a nice. Uh, no, the original, no, the original, the original one is, is actually gold. Yeah. 
what kind of camera have you got going on there? It moves in and out. I don't know. It keeps jumping in. I don't know what it is. It's like I think it. I think it has because I do videos like this, so it sort of follows you around. Well, that's good. You can go to the bathroom and it just follow you. And keep talking. <laughs> I'm like, come on, come on. <laughs> uh, okay, wait. I'm going to move on here. Um, I I don't know how you broke your cheekbone in the semi final, by the way, in Barcelona. How were you cleared to fight in the final? Was it detected at the time? I can't remember. It wasn't a techno because I remember if you if you watch my interview after the, the the finals, I was doing an interview. For, I think BBC were covering the fights, and they said to me that we live in pain. I said right here to this day, I still have tingling here, right here. I still like I'm on drugs or something, coke, <laughs> but but I just this was a fact. And then my my teeth were was all numb on my lip. Still have from here down, right, right down to the nerve, is that's where it's, when I do that, it's, it's really like like somebody poking at you. But then it was like electricity, and and say when he hit me, the the first round against Joel Kess, and we were actually actually talked to Joel the other day. The guy here on NBC wants to do like a, something like this, but he hit me in the the first round was even. I thought then he he won a six one or something. The computer second round he won. He hit me a good hook, and I started bleeding from the corner of my eye. But that was coming from my the nerve underneath the cheek, so it just goes to show how much how badly it was burst underneath, and my cheekbone was cracked in three places. But I say the last round, I'm gonna win the last round because I I got to the point where it was the pain the pain barrier was unbelievable because he hit me he hit me a straight jab, and I was like this I just shook my head, stood down the ring and shook my head while he stood away from me because he stood away, he boxed me, he wouldn't come to me, but he hit me a straight jab and I just went. Shook my head. If you watch the fight, you'll see that. And, and I was like wondering what was going on. And I'm thinking in my mind, why did it have to happen right here, of all places? But it, the semi final, the, the North Korean, I thought was like a, a war. It was a toe to toe battle. He just beat Totoroff in the, in the quarterfinals. And I remember Totoroff was in the dressing room right beside me before I went out for my, my, my quarterfinal fight. He was screaming like a, like a banshee because he had just lost the, the North Korean. But the North Korean was a he was a world bronze medalist as well, and I went out and beat him. He was hit me with everything, elbows and head and everything, and we we stood toe to toe, sixteen fifteen up in the last round. My last round was always my strongest, and I beat him twenty one sixteen, and he did the damage. The damage was already done. That was that that semi final was like a final fight. You know what I mean, the, just a toe to toe, like classic fight, and and then getting the final. You're getting the final. I think we went to the final 36 hours later. Was with because I fought that night like a something like a something like a Wednesday night. I'm not sure what it was. Then you fought. And I remember the final was like 10 o'clock on Friday morning. You know, so it was it was you're fighting. I fought my first four fights at night, and then my last fight in the final was. And I fought. I stepped in the ring probably about 10:30 because I had the life flyweight fight first, then I had every other weight class. So life fly bantam, then Oscar De La Hoya getting after me lightweight. So. The damage was done, and I'm in the final, and I knew it was my last fight in the ring. And I remember going back to the corner. You watch the the second round. I go back to the corner, and and um, Michael's late father, Austin, was in the corner. A great man, but Nicholas was there too. And and he said to me, "Oh, we're going to pull you out." And Nicholas, Nicholas didn't say it. Nicholas, I said, "No, no, 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 no." I just shook my head, no, because I was going out there guns blazing last round, which I did, and um, I won the last round. I said, but it's the, I never felt pain like in my life, and to this day, as an amateur pro, I never never felt anything. And there's reasons for everything. And I'd say that last round made everybody look at me and think, hey, you just keep keep walking through the the pain bar. It's indescribable how it was like almost you punch and somebody sticking like a knife in you, like a poke and poke and poke, and then electricity shooting down your body. And I say with my cheek was cracked when I'm back to Belfast, cheek one was cracked in three places, busted nerve. And the doctor said to me, had the cheek moved, my career was over. They would have, they would have had to put a plate in there, because you couldn't really fought with a metal plate in your face. And how long of a layoff did you have? I didn't fight till the third week in February. So it was a good, before I get into for a real fight, it was a good six months. I mean. But I was still worried about it, because as, as, as soon as I get hit, I'm thinking, is it going to be, is it, is it going to get 
for the Purgy game. But but the, the doctor says because it's like your your jaw, like the calcium build up here, it heals pretty quick and heals actually stronger. So I've never had any you to fought you see me in the, the pro ranks have fought the biggest punches in the world, never even damaged me. <laughs> never it just goes to show you because and I, I believe the headgear had a lot to do with it because when he he look when he hit me the right, he hit me a right hook when we're in close, he but we're actually in a clinch and the referee should have broke us. But then he, he, he hit me a right hook and just smacked me on the like that my eye was closed like this because it was the blood was coming out. And I think the headgear is smacking against you at the same time. So it did a lot more did more damage. What's your opinion about the, the headgear, Wayne, in general? Because you hear people say, it, okay, it kind of protects you, but it also allows you to take more punishment. Yeah, it's like a double impact. It's like, it's like, a, it's like a mini on a truck, on a motorcycle, like one hits one, bump, bump, bump. You know, like a, the, the double impact, triple impact. And I really believe that. Plus you've got, it's like one of a pair of blinkers. You can't really see the hooks coming. And... Casimir threw a red hook and I didn't really see it and he caught me right here. And I don't I don't really I don't it stops you from getting cuts or something like that. But it's been proven that took the headgear away. Yeah. It, going back to um Francie Barrett in ninety six Olympics, I, that's one thing I always remember very clearly, that he kept adjusting his, his headgear. And I spoke to him many, many years later about it. He said, I never trained with headgear. And then he said uh, I couldn't get used to it couldn't get used to it and it was too loose he's no he's right he is right I, i'm glad i'm glad the headgears are away it's i think it makes it's more like semi-pro now but the headgears didn't didn't protect you at all they just protect you from cuts that's all that's it that's it when people see less blood they think it's safer for example yeah um it, just uh, quickly touching on and i hope i pronounce his name right joel casimir the, the guy who beat you in the final and i know you became very good friends and you had this kind of long can a lifelong connection because of what you went through together but am i right in thinking you were both inducted into the nevada boxing hall of fame on the same day it's funny because yeah joel i go to a gym down around a corner called dlx the girl um true runs it she's a great woman and i was running her last year with one of my fathers and Joel Casimir was one of the coaches right now. And then, and then somebody, somebody put on, have a big screen, somebody put our Olympic final on. So me and Joel are standing there watching it and we're just, we're just looking at each other and we're just doing this. And, and even the last round, because remember the Nicholas told me, Joel told him in the last round, had it been another 30 seconds, he couldn't have made it. Cause I was pushing him and pushing him and pushing him and pushing him. And he was that type of fighter, but he, but say, world champion boxer and I never thought in my lifetime I'd ever get to meet him again but 96 he was number one um contender to get the belt or to get the Olympic gold again and he defected and took off came to America and whereas he, this week both were Olympic medalists both world champions we both came to Las Vegas that's weird isn't it that's a one-off because you never see you, you never really yeah you never really see the guy you ever fought in the final maybe Never meet him again, but we're actually here, and we're gonna we're gonna do like a another interview for the TV station here in a few weeks. And my and my gym, my gym's in the garage, so, and that that and they say we got inducted the same night. I have I've got a big banner, it's a big massive banner, and beside the ring hanging on the wall. It's the last time they used the banner it was two thousand nineteen, and you've got like about ten world champions on there: me and Casimir, Bernard Hopkins, and Winky Wright, guys like that, great great fighters. And I've got it. And my friend was here, and he. He seen me looking at it. And he's like, "Do you like that?" I'm like, "Yeah." He said, "Okay." Next day, he brought it around here. Now it's all digital. Now it's all digital, so you don't. There's no banners anymore. I like to have the because it's like a souvenir. And think about if you have a if you had a Muhammad Ali ticket from way back, worth a lot of money. <laughs> have you ever been back to Barcelona since then? Just even on holidays or anything? I would love to. My daughter, my daughter, now nah, she's 26. She. I would like to take her around. Please look at me where we've been. Yes, yeah, soak it in and keep it. Memories in your memories in your head forever. You know what I mean, and I say when you talk about that, I say I, I memories. I remember walking out into the, the Olympic Stadium with the the flag, and it was so it was so like unbelievable. I was just walking out there, and the stadium was packed, and the athletes were there, and and it was just the feeling. You you never get that feeling. You know what I mean, unless you do it. That, that's the reason I'm asking, because some Olympic villages are very neglected and like completely gone. 
or, or they're uh, like graffiti everywhere and they're abandoned. But Barcelona really take pride in their one. It looks fantastic. And, and you'll see your name there. There's a museum and everything, yeah. Also, Seoul as well. I like to go to Seoul to see. They had big, Seoul had like big high-rise apartments. And they were beautiful. They were beautiful. They were, they were beautiful. And I say back then, any, anybody who, who was a, a Korean who meddled got a brand new apartment and a pension for life. That's nice incentive. Your favorite Team Ireland Olympic moment, and you cannot say yourself. It can be any sport. I think that, you know, one of the best was, like for me, we're there. I was there and Michael Cruz gets a gold. I mean, our first ever for, for men, you, you have to, and I was sitting in the drug testing room with Joel Casimir trying to drink, get liquid. And I think then it was, a, it was great to, to see that first ever. And he's still the only male to, male to do it. Kitty Taylor, of course, went on and Kelly Harrington. But for an Irish thing that was there, that was, I just missed out. And to see Michael get it was just, that was, he set the, the roadmap for next, the next generation, I mean, to have that. And, and I was happy for him. It wasn't like I wasn't happy, you know what I mean? It was, I'm sitting in a drug testing room trying to pee and I couldn't pee. And we didn't go out to see him, couldn't to see him. But Joel Casimir was sitting beside him and he's, and he's fighting a Cuban. And I remember, the, I remember when the, the fight went over, I looked over at Joel, it was only really a small room. And he just looked at me and we just, just sort of went like this. You know what I mean? little bit of Olympic trivia for you. Five simple questions. I really don't expect you, they're not simple actually, but I don't expect you to know the answers, but just for a bit of fun. Okay. Number one, Ireland's first ever Olympic medalist. Any idea? First ever? That was way back in... 1928. <laughs> 1928? <laughs> <laughs> wow. It was, was track and field or something like that, wasn't it? Oh, athletics. You're right. Pat O'Callaghan. Yeah, I remember. I've, I remember. I don't know much about him, but I, I know it was definitely track and field. Pat O'Callaghan. Okay, number two. Uh, what sport, we touched on this earlier, so what sport has given Ireland the most Olympic medals? Boxing. It is boxing. Any idea how many? I think, there, I think there's something like 20 or less, is it? No. Less. You're close though. 18. Uh, three gold, three gold, five silver, one of those is yours, and 10 bronze. Okay, uh, number three, which Irish Olympian won a bronze medal, but received his medal four years later? And it's quite recently, actually. Quite recently? Why? Because of a controversial doping Scandal involving a Russian horse. Horse was it? Horses was it? No. No, actually, it was uh, speed walking. Uh, Robert Heffernan. Oh, speed. They have the speed walk in the Olympics. Wow, well, that's that's good. Fair play to him. But I can't believe it because so you what the city was juiced up for speed walking. Apparently, so to me, honestly, the, <laughs> I I don't want to disrespect the sport by saying this. I remember the Russian guy who got the medal and he, to me, he just looked like somebody who really needed to go to the bathroom quick. <laughs> yeah. So no, there is, they, it's a, it's, they're, 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 they're walking as fast as you can. Some people can run. You know what I mean? And there's a technique to Robert Hefner Hefner. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, actually, he comes from a very sporting family. His wife was an Irish Olympian and athletics, and his son and daughter have represented Ireland in uh, football. And the son is actually a professional player for Newcastle United and also played for AC Milan. Cahill Heffern. Brilliant. But it's, it's unfortunate that I didn't know something like that because over here, the Olympics is big. And I've watched the Olympics since I came here. But something they got was burst under the carpet, you know what I mean? Wasn't it? Because it's just a walk-in. 
yeah, it's, it's... I'll send you a link so, so you know who I'm talking about, yeah. Yeah, send me, yeah, th definitely. I will. Okay, next question here, nearly finished. The youngest ever Olympian for any country, even just guess the age. It's probably 12 or something. Like what was it, 12 or something? You're not far off. 10. 10 years of age. His name was Demet. Yes, gymnastics for Greece. His name was Demetrius Lundras, and the year was 1896. 10 years of age. And he won a bronze medal as well. 10 years old. Ten years old. See, boxing. I think some boxers should be allowed to go under fourteen, but you're not. You're not allowed. <laughs> no. What What is the legal age? Is it seventeen, eighteen? I think seventeen. 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 Okay. okay. Last one of these. Last one of these. If you get this wrong, you have a hundred percent record. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the most. The most medals of any individual athlete, any sport, any country. Swimming? Yes. Michael Phelps? Yes. Any idea how many? But there's somebody going to try to beat it this year. There's, a, there's, an, there's an athlete here who can become the most decorated. Is there? I didn't know that actually. Okay. Okay. So how many does Phelps have? He must have about over over twelve, probably. Definitely over twelve. Twenty-eight. That's that. That's like that's like me going to Olympics and competing in life, fly, fly, and fly with a band of <laughs> three. You're going to fight every day, three fights back to back. Be good, wouldn't it? They should allow you to do. They should allow you. To, they should allow you to do that two weight classes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just to put that into perspective, Ireland have 38 medals in, in their history as a country, and he has 28 individually. Uh, 23 of them are gold, three silver, two bronze. Michelle Smith would have, would have, would have, could have, should have had you know, back in night. That would have, like, that was sensational at the time. Because I, I, I know Michelle, 88, 92, she was there with us, and then all the medals she was getting, like, you go from one year to one, one extreme to the other extreme. <laughs> I mean, do you know what? We, we I know there was controversy surrounding her in 96, but she was never stripped of the medals. She still has them. Really? Is she still hit? Does she, does she still go down history as a, wow. Yeah, she got a ban, but she's actually officially Ireland's most decorated Olympian. Well, it's like Lance Armstrong was the most decorated <laughs> cyclist. Oh, do you know, can I tell you a funny one about Lance Armstrong? But they stripped, but they did. But they did strip him of his Olympic bronze and his Tour de France wins. They did, but wait till you hear that. There was a comedian on the TV one night and he said, I'm sick of all the, the, the abuse that Lance Armstrong is getting. He said he won seven Tour de France's while he was on drugs. So what? He said, when I was on drugs, I couldn't even find my bicycle. <laughs> that's what I, but that's what I was, I would say that with the Feder the Sagan Federation, at least. He didn't get caught, but there was so much paperwork to catch him. But look what look in boxing if you get if he gets like what do you call him the kid Garcia just got suspended for a year, big deal. One year got a big bigger suspension than, than he usually gets, usually five thousand dollars or ten thousand and a year suspension. He got a year suspension over a million, but you get to come back again. Dan Armstrong was stripped of it, his whole livelihood, everything, and all he's doing is is going faster than he's not. He's that cracking your pump. You know, boxing should. I always say, if you get caught, if you get caught once, they should ban you for a big ban, big suspension, and um, a lot of a lot of money. And the second time you do it, they should ban you for life. Because if you do it the second time, you're willing to, you're trying to you're trying to cheat the system. You know what I mean? They're always trying to be a step ahead. Like the Olympics this year, you're going to see everybody getting a lot of people getting caught because they're trying to be a step ahead of the testing, trying to mask it, trying to mask it, and then they're they're so detailed in there and testing people that you're caught but you're cheating this is something i should have asked you earlier um talking about that you know i was asking you about your standout moments in the olympics unfortunately there have been some negative standout moments also um 
and the, the scoring system in boxing gets heavily criticized at times. Is that something, is it a flawed system or is it just plain, how, you know, is it just corrupt sometimes? Well, I, I believe to this day that I should have been a three or four time world champion, three divisions, because my fight, well, the first fight was Zaragoza, split decision, lost fight of the year, don't get a rematch, should have had a trilogy. You know, you get a fight of the year, fight of the year trilogy, and that, that fight, the, the day Eddie Fudge died, thought I won. The referee that night, his wife was the one to give me the fight. And he said to me, going back to the hotel, I thought, I, you want to fight when I'm getting the papers between rounds? I'm thinking, what's going on here? But, and then my first, what the Hamed fight, come on. People to this day, Hamed ran from me for 12 rounds. Hamed ran, and Hamed made, Hamed made friends. He, he called me about four months ago. He called me. We, stood, we talked for about two hours. But he ran from me for 12 rounds, you know. And then when I fought Oscar Lares the first time up in Fresno, 10 years after I won the belt, I was completely, I was robbed. The, the commentators had me winning, except the three judges. I was fighting on an Oscar De La Hoya card against an Oscar De La Hoya fighter. So that, talking about bad decisions, there's nobody standing up to say, okay, tonight, well, how did this judge come to the decision? We need to talk about this next week. There's no union. There's nothing for the boxers to stand up. And we tried to start one of these last year, like a whole bunch of us. And unless you're willing to stand up, they're just going to brush under the carpet. And the bad decisions will be turned, not even turned around. You should be able to turn around in no contest, you know, something like that. But nothing happens. Usually nothing happens. And unfortunately, nothing's going to happen. And you've seen so many bad decisions. When you see a judge, 118, 110, one the other guy, 116, 110, then the other judge scores at 118, 110 the other way. That's that's 16 points of a difference. 16 points. Come on. You can't you can't be that much far. You can't be that far off. And rounds can be close. But come on. If you control two minutes of the of a round, two minutes, and somebody wins the last minute, they shouldn't win the round. But a lot of times they do. Because they one big shot. Not not hurting the guy or dropping him. But that one shot shouldn't win you the round. If you drop him, okay, it's different. But if somebody controls the round and boxes the head of it for two minutes, he should win the round. But unfortunately, unfortunately, it's not like that anymore. It's getting worse and getting worse. Yeah, they need to do something with that in quick. Okay, last question based on the Olympics. Uh, 2024, it marks the 100-year celebration of Team Ireland in the Olympic Games. Now, it's also Ireland have 10 boxers going to the Games. It's the biggest number of boxers representing Ireland since Rome 1960. That was the year Cassius Clay won his famous medal, his gold medal. Uh, so the only thing I want to say to you is any words of encouragement that you'd like to put out there for the fighters competing for Ireland? Is there, is there six women and four men or five and five? Something like this, I think. There's a lady in every lady's division. I know that. Well, there you go. Well, I say that when we fought in the Olympics in 92, there were seven of us. But there was no women. So that could have been one of the biggest ever then if a woman was involved. But I take my hat off to them because they, Nicholas, I always say Nicholas should be the coach. But I'm going to get, people's going to throw darts at me now. Whoa. Nicholas Cruz and Andrea should be the coach of Ireland. And it's ridiculous the knowledge he has in his head. He's got more knowledge in one hand than most of these trainers do. But I'm behind him 100%. If we watched him from here, you know, the coverage over here is good. The, the Americans love the Irish fighting. And with 10 people in the Olympics, we should get at least a gold or silver and a bronze. We get at least two or three of them, at least. We could get double gold. I'd like to see another, I'd like to see another male go for the gold, you know what I mean? But again, it's, it comes down to, if, it just comes down to the right. If you can bring your own judge along your left hook or your right hook, you don't have to depend on the judges. But unfortunately, there's, you know, a lot of politics in the sport of, of the Olympics, of course. And to have 10 going is is unbelievable. I think the, one of the kids at Walsh, he's at the second Olympics in it. And he could take a double, big double medals. He'd be like, like um, Paddy Barnes. Yeah, and Kelly Harrington is back as well, yeah. And Kelly Harrington. So they, they're double, there can be double double medalists as well. And if Kelly, get get double goals, not bad, it? <laughs> nobody's ever did, nobody's ever, nobody's ever did that to double gold. So here's hoping Ireland can deliver a few medals in, in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for your time today, Wayne. It's been an absolute pleasure going down, trip down memory, Olympic memory lane.
So thank you for sharing your memories with us today. Well, I'll show you. I'll show you around here. When we go off the air here, I'll show you around here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're into the interview now. What do you want to show me?